I'm uh, very excited about the topic this morning. It was a few years back that um, I was getting ready. I think maybe I was in the Philippines or somewhere getting ready to preach a message on salvation and baptism and baptism in the Holy Spirit. And the Lord spoke something to me. Every once in a while, the Lord will, will give you a key and, and it just kind of unlocks something. And he said to me, son, if you preach it clear, I'll come and do it. Right? What we preach, the Holy Spirit comes in the room and he does. Today we're going to talk about salvation. We're going to talk about water baptism. We're going to talk about baptism in the Holy Spirit and fire. Anybody like the fire? And if we, if we preach that in faith and you respond in faith, the same God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Moses will be in this room to deliver, to heal, to save, and to baptize. Amen? What I love about the gospel is it is the same message they preached 2,000 years ago. And today I'm gonna bring you the simple ABCs of the gospel. We should never outgrow the simple ABCs of the gospel, because if we do, we miss it. And so as, as we dive into many different scriptures and we look at different things at different angles, I wanna encourage you to lean in, to give the word of God your full attention. And I believe that today people, I, I just keep hearing in my spirit, even this morning when I woke up, I heard the Lord say to me that people that have been enslaved to sin will be set free. I really believe it in my heart that there's gonna be people that come to the altar today that have been in bondage to sin and they will be set free. I heard the Lord say that people are gonna lay down weight and they're gonna lay down sin and they're gonna pick up the fire. We're called to carry the fire in 2023. We need to be a people that carry the fire of God, amen? So I wanna encourage you to maybe put your phones on airplane mode, unless you've texted 59090 and text in notes, then you got those. Just stay focused on the notes. Lean in, let's allow the word of God to move and be powerful in this room today, amen? The title of this message is Water Baptism. Who's excited that people are getting water baptized? <laughs> water baptism, immersed in dunamis. Immersed in dunamis. In Acts 2, verse 37, it says this. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent. Say it like a preacher, say repent. repent. That, that was, come on, say it like a real preacher. Say repent. repent. Let me hear you in the balcony, say repent. Which, by the way, I just want to take a moment and pause here. Repentance is the language of the kingdom. John the Baptist said repent. Jesus said repent. Come on now, somebody. Peter said repent, right? Paul said repent and believe. Jesus in Revelation says repent to the churches. There's no gospel, ABCs of the gospel without the word repent. Do not allow some cheap grace to rob you of the gift of repentance. We are a people of repentance. He said repent and be baptized. Everybody say baptized. Come on, I thought we were preachers this morning. I need some Book of Acts, Holy Spirit filled preachers in the room. Just for a moment, just pretend like you're in high school and we're at youth camp. I got one come on and three move on. Chris, move on. All right, there we go, there we go. Everybody say baptized. baptized. That was good. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Say the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. I'm thankful for that because I was far off. 
everyone who the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized. Say baptized. That was good. And they, that day, were added about 3,000 souls into the kingdom of God. Will you pray with me? Jesus, I pray today as we talk about the simple ABCs of the gospel, that there would be revelation in this room, that we would have ears to hear and eyes to see, and hearts that would respond to the word of God. Lord, I pray that people that have come in here one way would leave transformed and changed by the power of God. Lord, I pray that your dunamis power would fall in this place and we would leave transformed and baptized in your son Jesus. If you're in agreement with that prayer, will you say amen? Amen. amen. That word bab baptized in the Greek is baptizo. It means to immerse, to submerge, to cleanse by dipping or submerging, or I like this one, to overwhelm. Don't you like that? Are you overwhelmed by the Lord? Has he come, I just, I just imagine standing in the Pacific Ocean, I grew up on the West Coast, Washington State, standing there in the ocean, I got some Washington State people out there. It's so cold in the Pacific Ocean that you freeze even with a wetsuit on. And I remember praying for bigger waves. Come on, Lord, send a bigger one. But has, has anybody ever been caught or overwhelmed by a large wave? You know what I'm talking about? What if we were caught and overwhelmed by the Lord? This is how we're to live. There's a funny example, but it really shows what that word baptism means. There's a Greek poet, a physician named Nicander who lived about 20 BC, and he wrote a recipe for making pickles. Let me say it this way, have you been pickled? And it's helpful because he uses these two words that are similar but a little bit different. Nicander says that in order to make a pickle, the vegetable must first be dipped, or it's this word, baptio, in boiling water, and then baptized, everybody say baptized, in the vinegar solution. Both verbs uh, concern the immersing of a vegetable in a solution, but the first is temporary. The second, the act of baptizing the vegetable produces a permanent change. You get, once that, Pickling cucumber is immersed and left in that vinegar. It comes out, it's a pickle. It can't go back to being a cucumber. If you are truly saved, if you are truly baptized, if you are truly immersed and submerged and overwhelmed in Christ, you will look different. You will sound different. You will be different. I, I think about this, Christianity is not a bite your lip religion. What, what do I mean by this, right? Oftentimes believers driving around town, Fort Worth, heading down 35, heading to Alliance, somebody cuts you off, you wanna give them a piece of your mind but you bite your lip and you do the Christian thing, look at your neighbor and say he's talking to you. You want to do the Christian thing, right? Or that person wrongs you and you're like, mm, ah, right? And then you do the Christian thing. Can I submit to you this morning that when that person cuts you off, what should come out of you is the fruit of the Holy Spirit? Have you been pickled? Have you been baptized? Have you been immersed? Or have we so lowered the standard of Christianity and we've made it into a bite your lip religion. It's not meant to be that way. Let me say it this way. When you are squeezed, what comes out of you? Have you been baptized? When you are squeezed, when you go through pressured situations like Costco on a Saturday afternoon, 
and you got to get back for the college football game and you get your cart loaded up. Some brother back there is agreeing with everything I'm saying. He's fully alive. All right. I see you, buddy. I'll give you a high five after the service. He's like, I know exactly what you're talking about. You get your cart, you begin to move towards aisle five, check out. And a couple people, you start racing them. Or you're like kicking their cart, trying to get in front of them. And then you're mad because one of them beats you and you don't even think about sharing the gospel. What if Costco became a mission field? What if you let a couple people pass you and you got a couple people behind you and you just waited long enough you realize, okay, once the line gets long enough, they're not gonna go find a different line. And you say, hey, my name's Chris, I'm from Mercy Culture. I'm here to tell you that Jesus can meet all of your needs. I know I'm being a little bit funny, but I wanna get a point across. When we are baptized, when we are a believer, when we are immersed and overwhelmed and filled with the dunamis power of God, we will look different and we will act different. It is not a bite your lip religion. It is from the inside out you are transformed and Jesus comes out of you. I just want you guys to know, I talk to a lot of people in this city and they see your cross equals mercy signs. Just so you know, every Wednesday and Thursday, our teams pray and we go out into the community. You can come with us anytime you want. And we walk around and they go, oh yeah, that church with the cross equals mercy signs. So just remember, the next time you drive, it just doesn't mean that the cross equals mercy for your driving, but you're representing all of us when I'm out there sharing the gospel for us, okay? Don't forget, they're seeing it. Don't look at my truck, I don't have one yet. It is on my van, it's just not made my truck yet. Right after the service, I'll go put it on the truck. Next time you see me, my truck will be fully baptized in the cross equals mercy. Chelsea, can you make sure that happens? Okay, good. All right, so a definition of baptism, as I've been preparing over the past few weeks, is this, when a true believer is baptized, they become fully immersed and completely submerged in Christ to the point that they are so overwhelmed by the new creation life now inside of them by the Holy Spirit that they look and they act like a new person. That's the kind of church I wanna be. That's the kind of believer I wanna be. Lord, when, you, when I'm squeezed, I want you to come out of me, amen? In the Bible, there are three different baptisms. And I'm gonna walk through these, and if, if you grew up in a church like I did, a good church that loved Jesus, the people sincerely loved God, but they didn't have a full understanding or revelation of these three baptisms, then this may be new for you. For others of you, this may be review, but don't, don't just check out, I want you to engage in this, because I believe that there'll be something for you, and, even if you understand this, I would encourage you to listen to this so that when you're out in the community, you can lead other people in the baptisms, amen? You can lead people to salvation. You can lead people in water baptism. We baptize people on my back porch quite often. And you can lead people into the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So I want you to pay attention and learn this, study this so when you meet people, you can lead them in these baptisms, amen? The first one is salvation. Salvation, this is where the Holy Spirit baptizes us into Jesus, into the body of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, it says this, for by one spirit we were all baptized, say baptized, into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. Let's talk about salvation for a moment. Salvation cannot be inherited. We're gonna take a moment to talk about salvation. Salvation cannot be inherited. I, like I've told you, I spend many hours in our city out with the good news, trying to bring people into the kingdom. 
And what I hear so often when I talk to them, where are you at with Jesus? Well, my mom believes, my daddy believes, my, my, my grandpa was a Baptist preacher, my, my, my great grandma was a prayer warrior. That's, that's great. They probably prayed for you, that's why I'm here. But I'm asking, where are you at with Jesus? See, if do not be deceived. When you stand before God, your husband won't be there, your wife won't be there, your on fire child for Jesus won't be there, your pastor won't be there, your great grandfather who was a missionary won't be there, it's gonna be you and Jesus. It's not something that can be inherited. It's something that you must believe in and you must follow Jesus in. It's personal. Look at your neighbor and say it's personal. You must believe to be saved. In Romans 10 verse nine it says this, because if you confess, say you. See that, if you confess with, say your mouth, that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's personal. It's not something that can be inherited. Another thing to understand about salvation, salvation cannot be worked for. It cannot be worked for. Sin is not only an action, the action or transgression of doing wrong, it's the sin in one's heart or the iniquity that we were born into, right? We know in Romans 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We, we, we gotta understand that sin is not just an action, meaning if I do something wrong, I can outweigh that with doing something right. Now, for a moment, I wanna bring a comparison between Christianity and Islam. I can speak into this because I travel a lot to the Middle East and I have a love and a heart for the Islamic people. It's a, it's a passion of mine to see them understand the good news of who Jesus is. And they need to understand the good news because their religion teaches them work-based salvation. What do I mean by this? In the Islamic faith, they believe that sin is only an action. So if I do something wrong, I can outdo that by doing something that is right. So they live their whole life trying to do more good than bad. But all along, they do not know if when they stand before their God named Allah, if he, if, if he will receive them or not, to the point where they will pray five times a day, and before they pray, they have a certain ritual in which they wash. Their, their ankles, their feet, their hands, because if they do not wash a certain way, Allah may not hear their prayers. And there's Ramadan and how they fast and, and, and they need to make sure that they fast a certain way so they can work. And then there's a pilgrimage that, you know, they don't believe in idol, like having an idol before Allah, but they have a black rock that they travel to Mecca to kiss. It's kind of weird. Right, and if they go there and they kiss this rock and do these things, then God may receive them based on the works that they do. I wanna submit this to you. Every other religion is man's attempt to get to God. But Christianity is God getting to man. This is why it's good news. So what do we do when we're there in the Middle East? We begin to tell them that when Jesus came, he came to reveal that sin was not just an action, but it was the iniquity found in a man's heart. Right, he says, not only can a man not commit adultery, but he cannot think it in his heart. We begin to reveal to them that sin is a heart issue. That's why you've gotta be born again. That's why you've got to be given a new heart. You can't 
clean up this heart. It says in Ezekiel 36, 26 that he removes the heart of stone and he places a heart of flesh. That's what it means to be born again. That's why when Jesus in John 3 is sitting there with Nicodemus, right? And he says, Nicodemus, you must be born again. And Nicodemus says, how can I, an old man, be born again? Must I crawl back into my mother's womb and be reborn? And Jesus says, no, Nicodemus, I'm not talking about the physical. I'm talking about the spiritual. Right, because here's Nicodemus, the teacher of teachers, a Pharisee of Pharisees, done every religious thing that you and I could ever dream of doing. But yet Jesus looked at Nicodemus and said, you, Nicodemus, must be born again. And I'm saying to you today that you must be born again. And that's something that you receive by faith not something that you work for in your own flesh. That is the good news. In Ephesians 2 verse four, it says this, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses. Come on, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places, in Christ Jesus. Salvation doesn't come through church attendance or even the gifts moving through you. This is for you as much as it is for me. We know this scripture in Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I walk all over this city, really all over this earth, whether I'm in Detroit or Oregon or Kentucky, wherever my feet find me, and I say to somebody, how are you doing with Jesus? This is what they say. Haven't been to church in a while. I didn't ask you how you were doing with church. See, going to church doesn't save you. Just like going to McDonald's doesn't make you a cheeseburger. Go to Chick-fil-A. Just not today because they're closed. Okay, false advertisement, moving on. See, if we're not careful, it's like we, we say, well, I went to church, I'm good. No, do you know him? Better yet, does he know you? I love what Pastor Landon said one day. He said, being in the secret place isn't so much about you feeling God, it's about God feeling you. I thought, okay, there it is. Does he feel you? Does he know you? Does he know your name? Or are we just playing a religious game? You are saved because you intimately know Jesus and he has become your Lord. Which by the way, I believe that he cannot be your savior unless he is first your Lord. It is Lord and Savior. And we have a lot of people that want the benefits of Jesus, but they don't want Jesus. As for me and my house, I want Jesus. I want him, I wanna know him, I wanna walk with him intimately. Don't think that you can walk to an altar, pray a prayer and it'll all be okay. See, because as important as the altar and the prayer was, see, you were coming here to start a relationship with a man and his name is Jesus. Salvation is not a prayer, it's a person. So this is why the vision of mercy culture is to take people from corporate encounters with God to daily personal encounters with God. Why? 
Because if you don't daily personally encounter the presence of God, I don't know if you're saved. Do you know him? It'd be like this, I invite you to my wedding. I've been married now about 15 years. Let's say you came to my wedding, you watched us say I do, I kiss the bride, I walk away, and I never say another word to my wife, Chelsea. Do I have a marriage in 15 years? Don't be deceived, thinking that because you prayed a prayer in 2004, that you're right with God. Come on, somebody. This is why daily personal encounter with God is so important, because he is eternal life. I'm gonna show it to you in scripture. Salvation, right, right here. It's the intimately know Jesus, John 17, verse three. By the way, this is Jesus speaking. Like if there's ever a moment in the Bible to slow down and listen, it's where Jesus talks about eternal life. Like if there is ever a moment to pause, your eternity hinges upon this scripture. Like if there is a pin drop moment in a church, it would be this scripture right here. John 17, verse three, where eternal life, come on, is telling you what eternal life is. Did you catch that? Eternal life is Jesus. He came and said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Right, he is the creator and the sustainer of all things. He's eternal. The Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is eternal life. That's why when they carried baby Jesus to be circumcised into the temple and Simeon sees him, he says, my eyes have seen thy salvation. It's not a prayer. It's not a moment at an altar. It's a real man seated on a real throne in a real heaven who's interceding for you right now in this real moment to repent of your sins and to turn to God and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We gotta catch this. So what does he say? He says, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent, that we know God. This is why daily personal encounters with God are the most important thing. If you have been in this church for more than six months and you do not daily encounter God, wake up. If when whatever pastor or leader comes up and begins to share the vision of this church, you check out and go, here we go again, you don't even understand that that is the point of our existence. That's why every time I hear it, I'm at full attention because I understand if I don't have that in intimacy with Jesus, I may stand before him and he say to me, depart from me for I never knew you. But I cast out demons. I gave tithes and offerings. I even got a word of knowledge back in 2022. Be careful. Do you know him? Do you know him? And what you feel in the room is not condemnation, it's called conviction. See, we get those things mixed up. When a, when a preacher begins to preach, we think, oh man, take it easy. No, 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 listen, this is conviction and you need to get your life right with God. You need to feel the weight of the words I am speaking. Salvation is not inherited. Salvation is not worked for. Salvation is not based on your church attendance or your so-called gifting. It's a gift that you receive from God and a personal relationship that you steward daily in your personal encounters with God. Let it hit our hearts today, Lord. Salvation is a free gift that is received when one turns to the Lord. 
In Acts 3, verse 19, it says this. Now repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. Then times of refreshing, refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord and he will again send you Jesus, your appointed Messiah. We turn to God. He has already turned to us. Let me explain. All over this city I meet people and they say, I'm, just not, I'm not quite ready yet. I need to get my life together. I'm just not quite ready to come to church. I'm not quite yet to say, it, to say a prayer. I gotta get my life together so that when I present myself to God, hopefully he'll turn to me when I say I'm sorry. As if God's got his back turned to you and you hope that you can say all the right things for God to turn around and look at you. That's not the gospel. The gospel is a God that left heaven, came to earth, and rescued you while you were yet a sinner. All he needs you to do is turn. All he needs you to turn. You can't clean yourself up. You can't change yourself. You were born a sinner. You're gonna remain a sinner until you've been born again. What you need to do is turn to God. And when you turn to him, he will collide with you. This is the gospel. This is the good news of Jesus. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You see this in the scripture. He's saying, come to me. In John 10, verse nine, you see Jesus say, yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and find good pastures. The thief's purpose is to steal and to kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and a satisfying life. See, as I meet people all over this community, I say, where are you at with Jesus? They go, I believe. I believe, I believe in Jesus. I'm like, but your life doesn't look it. Doesn't look like you've been baptized, immersed, or pickled. It looks like you're lost and confused and you don't know your father. See, there's a difference between believing and knowing. There's a difference between, yeah, I believe in Jesus. Like, you can believe in Jesus and be going exactly the wrong direction. You could drive by my house today drive by my front door and say, I believe that Chris Donald has a front door. It's a nice front door. But if you ever step through that door and been attacked by my five-year-old Noah and my three-year-old Esther, like have you experienced the benefits of my table and the joy of my family? See, there's a lot of people that say, yeah, I believe in Jesus, but he says in John 10, that he's the door in some translations it says the gate in others. But both of those have a threshold. And I believe that there's even people in this room, you're like, yeah, I believe in Jesus. But have you crossed over the threshold? What's on the other side of that door? Let me tell you, abundant life. Not an abundant bank account. Not a raise it or a title, an abundant life, meaning you receive the abundance of the Holy Spirit. Meaning when the world is in chaos, you're at peace. When the world is lost and trying to find satisfaction, you're satisfied. You, when you are squeezed, Jesus comes out of you. Come on. So there's abundant life, and then there is eternal life. That's what is across that threshold. My question to you today is, is have you crossed over? See, because I can believe that eating healthy is good for me, and then I can eat like a trash can. I can believe that Starting a work, workout routine tomorrow could be good for me 
but I'm really not gonna start it tomorrow. See, at a certain point, you actually have to do it. You've gotta step through the door, step through the gate and receive the benefits of Jesus. Number two is this, water baptism. Water baptism, the first one is salvation, the second one is water baptism. A disciple baptizes another disciple in water. Matthew 28, verse 19, this is the verse that motivates me every day of my life. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Water baptism is the first act of obedience to Jesus when we are saved. When we go into the water, we are making a public and prophetic statement that we are identifying with Jesus in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. What is a prophetic act? It's an act or an action, something we do under the anointing and unction of the Holy Spirit as a step of faith, as an act of obedience to release the power, the presence, and the victory. Come on, there's gonna be a lot of victory tonight. Oh man, we're gonna have a victory party. There's gonna be a lot of shouts of victory tonight when people come up out that water. Victory of God and the solution, think about it. An Old Testament example of a prophetic act. The people of Israel walking around the walls of Jericho. The prophetic act, right, that would seemingly not be something that could defeat an enemy like Jericho. Walk around the walls, shout. That's a prophetic act where we saw a victory and an outcome of God's power and his presence moving on behalf of the Israelites. A New Testament example, communion, right? You have a simple wafer and grape juice. But when you in faith take that, you're identifying with his body and with his blood. It's the same as with water baptism. Water baptism is a burial ceremony. In Romans 6, verse 1, it says this, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin live in it? Do you, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like this. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved. Do you hear that word? Enslaved to sin. And I heard the Lord say that people that were enslaved to sin would have victory over sin because they identify with what Jesus has done on the cross. Water baptism is a burial service. Right, if you have a family member who passes away, you make sure that they are dead before you put them in the ground. Right, ABCs of the gospel, I told you. We're gonna be simple today, but I'm going somewhere with this. You make sure that that person is fully dead before you put them in the ground. I wanna tell you today that water baptism does not save you. Water baptism is a sign that you have fully died and you have been risen in new life with Christ. So today when 200 plus people are water baptized, we're gonna have a burial and a resurrection service at 5 p.m. And those enemies that have been attached and, and attacking people holding people in bondage will remain in the water. And you'll come up in the power, the dunamis power of God as we put our faith into action. In Galatians 2 verse 20, it says this, 
My old self has been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. It has come. We must follow Jesus in everything. Not just in some things. In everything. There's a scripture in John 12, verse 20. It says this. Some Greeks who had come to Jerusalem for the Passover celebration paid a visit to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee. They said, sir, we want to meet Jesus. Now, just for a moment, right? We know that at Christ's birth, the Magi came from the east, right? And now getting close to his death, the Gentiles are coming from the west. Right, Jesus knows the Gentiles are looking for me, it's time. This is a sign for Jesus to know that it's time. It's, it's his time to do what he came to do. Then he said, sir, they said, sir, we wanna meet Jesus. Philip told Andrew about it. And they went together to ask Jesus and Jesus replied, now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter his glory. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone, but its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. And then he doesn't stop there. Okay, we're gonna continue reading in a moment. I think if we're not careful, we think, man, I'm, I'm so thankful that Jesus died for me and he went through these things for me. And, and listen, I am thankful and it's all by the grace of God that I'm saved, but I need to understand that I follow Jesus meaning I have to die a death to this world. Listen to what Jesus says right after he makes that statement. Those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. Let that sink in. Will keep it for eternity, eternity. We'll keep it for eternity. Let that sink in. Anyone who wants to serve me must follow me because my servant must be where I am. My servants must be where I am. And the Father will honor anyone who serves me. Now my soul is deeply troubled. Should I pray, Father, save me? from this hour, but this is the very reason I came. When we're in the Middle East and we're working, whether that be in Iraq or Pakistan or other areas, we've asked certain leaders, what is the difference between Western Christianity and Eastern? This is what they say. You guys don't truly count the cost. See, there in the Middle East, it may take a person four or five months before they decide to be saved. But they completely reckon themselves dead to this world. Because the moment that they say, Jesus, I choose you, is the moment they lose their family, their friends, their career, and their life. But see, the way we view it in the West is, well, I got next week, I mean, I know pastor said that, but I'll work on it. Next week, I'll fast next year. I'll pray tomorrow. Now let this sink in. Do you love your life? Are you holding on to things? Have you not count the cost? Have you not gone all in? Do not allow this culture to deceive you. I reckon myself dead so I can be alive. I believe today that people are gonna be born again again. 
I believe today people are gonna have encounters with the presence of God, that your lives are gonna be lit on fire, that people are gonna be baptized in dunamis, that there's gonna be life that's like almost like, like pads being put on your chest, bringing you back to life, to the reality that what you do today matters. How you live your life. Do you have one foot in and one foot out? Listen, the Bible says the way is narrow. Why is it narrow? Because it's the width of a man. It's the width of Jesus, the door. Meaning if you got one foot in and one foot out, you ain't gonna make it through the door. You've gotta be saved in Christ, baptized, immersed in Jesus and brought up in the resurrection power of God. He's gotta know you and you've gotta know him. Am I preaching to anybody this morning? If, if you're like, man, this guy just yelled the whole time at me. I wasn't just yelling at you, I was yelling at everybody. Even you guys online, I love you. Listen to this verse, Galatians 6 verse 14. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Has the world been crucified to you? Is he ultimate Lord in your life? Today, I hope if your answer is no, it becomes yes. It's the best way to live. If somebody could come to the keys, it'd be a perfect time. The last baptism is spirit baptism. This is where Jesus, <laughs> baptizes us in the Holy Spirit. It's not baptism of, it's baptism in. Meaning Jesus is the one doing the baptism. In Matthew three, verse 11, it says this, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. He in this passage is Jesus. Jesus will baptize. Jesus wants to completely immerse you, submerge you, and overwhelm you in dunamis. What does that look like on Monday morning? Do not lower the bar of what normal Christianity is. What would it look like to wake up on Monday morning saved, huh, right with God, baptized old man dead up resurrected, identifying with Christ, and immersed and clothed in the power of God. What does that look like? <laughs> that looks like a city being saved. That looks like transformation. That looks like, oh man, that looks like heaven coming to earth. Do not lower what we think normal is. This is normal Christianity. Jesus is our example. Did he do all three? Well, number one, he didn't have to be born again. He was born right. So that we could be born again. Number two, second baptism, John baptized Jesus in water. And then number three, he was baptized, Jesus was baptized in the Holy Spirit when he came up out of the water. Look in Matthew 3, verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John. To be, to be baptized by him. John would have preferred him say, uh, would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Think about it, because I just read a scripture where John is prophesying, saying there comes one mightier than I who's gonna baptize in the Holy Spirit and fire. So here he is, 
And John's like, whoa, I've been prophesying about you. You baptize me. Jesus says, no, you baptize me. So then what happens? I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented, and when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. This is the first time we see the Holy Spirit come and remain on somebody, right? We'd have the judges, the prophets, the kings where the Holy Spirit would come and go. But now in Jesus, we see the Holy Spirit coming and remaining. In Luke 3, 22, the Holy Spirit in bodily form descended upon him like a dove. In Luke 4, verse one, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, was led into the wilderness. In Luke 4, 14, Jesus returned to Galilee, filled with the Holy Spirit's power. In Luke 4, 18, Jesus stands up in the synagogue on the Sabbath and declares, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. I'm here to tell you today that the Spirit of the Lord wants to rest upon you. I'm here to tell you today that the dunamis power of God wants to close you, clothe you, immerse you, submerge you, and overwhelm you, and you can live that way. You can live that way. For a moment, I wanna show you something in the Old Testament that's a picture of the new. In the Old Testament, you have the Israelites in Egypt, and Jesus says to them, put blood over the doorposts. The blood over the doorpost will keep you safe as the angel passes by. That is salvation. Then you have the people of Israel leaving the land of bondage, coming up to the Red Sea. Here's Moses in front of them, pillar of fire and cloud behind them, and the enemy that's enslaved them, chasing them down. Moses lifts up the staff, The Red Sea parts. They walk through on dry ground. When the morning light comes, Moses lifts up his staff again and the walls of water come down and they destroy Pharaoh's army. That is water baptism. Water baptism is deliverance. Water baptism is victory. Right, there's many Christians that have been saved, but they're still living in bondage. But I'm telling you, if you get in that water and you believe in faith, that when you go under that water, you'll come up and you identify with Christ and his resurrection and you daily encounter with Jesus, you can walk in freedom. You can live a life of fire and no religious person can talk you out of it. And then what do you have? Right, they're saved. Right, they're saved, blood over the doorpost. They're baptized, delivered through the sea. But then you have the people living in the wilderness. See, there's another baptism. It's called the Jordan River. There's so many believers that are living in the wilderness, not empowered by dunamis. They're saved, they're delivered, but they're not empowered. What would it look like if you were empowered by dunamis to live every second of every day in devotion to God? Right, what happens? They walk up to the river. He's talking to Joshua. He says, I promise you, if you walk across that water, I will be with you like I was with my servant Moses. What does he say to us? He says, I promise you, if you go into all the world and preach the gospel and make disciples, I will be with you with dunamis power. 
I want to say to you that if you're here and you have not been baptized in the Holy Spirit and received the fire of God, today is your day. If you're here and you're saying, Chris, I don't think I've ever been saved, today is your day. If you're here and you're saying, I've never been water baptized, or I was, see for me, I was water baptized when I was 12 or 13. It didn't mean anything to me. I got a cool cross pin and I didn't understand what the cross was. But when I was 18, when I was born again, when I was delivered, when I was filled with the Holy Spirit, that water meant something completely different. Luke 24, verse 49, will you stand with me all over the room? And behold, God, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power, dunamis from on high. This last scripture I wanna show you is in 1 Corinthians 10, verse one. It says this, for I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. In this one scripture, you see all three baptisms. The cloud represents the baptism in the Holy Spirit. The sea represents water baptism. And Moses is a picture of Jesus. It's a picture of the blood, right? And I'm here to tell you that maybe you're here and you're like, Chris, I've been enslaved to something. Something has ownership in my life. For a moment, I want you to imagine that you're standing at the Red Sea and your leader, Moses, is in front of you and he lifts up that rod and you see the water part and he begins to walk. You look back, you have bondage, you have sin, you have compromise, you have destruction, you have torment, or you have a savior. Just for a minute, think about it, you're there. This, it really happened. You're standing there, Moses walking through on dry ground. Do I want to hold on to this or do I want that? Do I want this or do I want that? I'm here to tell you that you want Jesus. The only thing that will satisfy you, the only thing that will actually complete you is Jesus. Don't lie to yourself. Holding on to Egypt and the bondage and the torment and the lack of peace so you can keep a hold of your life. Give it to Jesus.